Hi everyone, welcome to another one of my live streams where I interview talented IT professionals who got endorsed for the UK Global Talent Visa. If you are joining this stream for the first time, you have never seen me and been on this channel, welcome, really glad to see you join. If this is the type of content uh, that you're interested in, make sure to subscribe to the channel because there will be more videos like this, more live streams like this in the future. And also there is already uh, a huge backlog of content that you can enjoy. Uh, a little bit of uh, warm up that we do in the beginning usually if you are watching this live, let us know in the comments, just say hi, uh, let us know where you're joining us from, what you do for a living and what your interest in this topic is, whether you're planning to move to the UK and when. Uh, this will help us understand what kind of audience we have today, but also this will clearly help YouTube algorithms um, show this video to more people and potentially help more people. So uh, I appreciate any kind of support you can show at this point. Uh, for those who haven't met me before, a little bit like a short intro about me. My name is Nadia. I'm a self-taught software engineer. I currently work as a developer relations engineer at Intercom. I'm originally from Belarus. I'm based in London right now. And this year I was endorsed for the Global Talent Visa. Afterwards, I got very excited about all the opportunities that this visa brings. I got excited about researching it. I got a little bit obsessed with the topic, to be honest. So I started interviewing people who uh, were endorsed for this visa as well. And also I started helping and consulting people who want to increase their chances for getting endorsed. If you are interested to see how I might help you increase your chances, uh, please check out the links to the website that you can see in the description box uh, down below. Um, yeah, let me just see whether we are seeing people joining. Um, yeah, we already have some people. Let us know uh, where you join us from, us from. This will uh, be, I think, interesting for us. Uh, we usually get quite an international crowd on, the, on those streams. So uh, really excited for today because I interview people from all walks of life on this channel when it comes to the visa. There is this myth that you have to be a software engineer, like ideally working at Facebook to get this visa. This is not true. And yes, I have interviewed my my fair share of uh, engineers from Facebook, but this is not definitely not the only uh, category of people who can get the visa. I'm very excited to be interviewing more people who represent the business side of the visa. So uh, you can be a technical candidate or a business candidate. And in this case, I'm very excited to uh, to welcome Aisha to this, to this live stream, who is a digital content marketing specialist. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nadia. Thanks for the intro. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, do I just introduce myself? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what you do for a living. Perfect. Well, I'm Aisha. I'm a digital content marketer. I am from Lagos, Nigeria. I currently live in London on the Global Talent Visa. I have been doing content marketing for around six years now. Um, I did start my career as a generalist, so I started my career as a digital marketer, um, and that meant that I was working on a wide variety of things. I was, so I did like email marketing, social media management, content writing, paid ads, lots of different things really. And then when I decided that um, content was what I wanted to do full time, I decided to specialize. And yeah, I've been doing content marketing since then. So that's me. Amazing, thank you for the intro. So where does UK come into this? How did you think about coming here? When did it happen? And why? how did you find out about this visa? Was this the first visa that you got here or were you like going through another visa route? So your visa history, basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure, let's get into it. So it's a bit of an interesting story, actually. Um, I had never lived in the UK before I moved here this year. I moved here um, at the end of May. I had never lived here before. I had visited a number of times. Um, but before I moved to the UK, I was living in Mexico and working there with a company that I was working for <laughs> in Mexico. And to be honest, I had no plans to move to the UK this year. Um, I came to London on holiday in December of 2021. This is 2022, so last year, December. And I had such a lovely time with my friends. That was just um, around six months after I had moved to Mexico. Um, and, you know, visiting the city was a really, really different experience from living in Mexico. Um, in Mexico, I had a lovely time, don't get me wrong, but I didn't have any community. I didn't have any friends um, that, you know, I had known for long. I was just making new friends, learning a lot about the new culture, trying new food, everything was really different. Um, but coming here, 
London offered just a bit of warmth to me in terms of, you know, I had my friends, I have family in the UK as well. So it's also closer to home. So there were a lot of things that were working for the city for me um, when I came on holiday in December, but I still didn't necessarily um, decide to move then because for me, thinking about moving was going to be a complicated process. It meant that I either had to start looking for a new job and, you know, it's, it's actually really hard to get a job that would sponsor your visa as a marketing um, specialist in the UK, just cause a lot of companies, you know, don't just don't hire lots of like international marketers and then relocate them. Oftentimes you find that a lot of people like to hire locally for marketing roles. Um, and it makes sense, yeah, but so for me, I was just like, yeah, this is this is going to be a challenge if I wanted to move here. Um, but then my friend actually who, is also a marketer, but she's a growth marketer and she also does like a wide variety of things. She um, told me about the Global Talent Visa and she was also living in the UK on that visa. Um, and it was just a really interesting thing because she, she had told me about it before actually, but I still didn't consider it as a possibility for me because like I said, she does a wide variety of things. She's a YouTuber, she does her growth marketing, but she has lots of different experience with lots of different product companies. And for me at that time, I had only worked in a full-time role with one product company. So for me, I just felt like this is going to be really hard to get this visa. And I still didn't think that, you know, it was going to be a possibility for me, but I decided, you know what, I'm going to just do some research and see if this thing is even possible because I was operating from a place of just what she had told me without having any other extra knowledge. Um, and I immediately ruled it out for myself just from that knowledge. So when she told me that, you know, it would be a good opportunity, I decided to do some more research and yeah, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. First of all, congrats on this. Uh, such an amazing achievement. I know how difficult it is to get this visa the pro requirements uh, it's all quite tough but also it's doable and i think this is the point of those live streams to encourage people to do that so you said that at first you didn't think that you were qualified for this visa you will be eligible so what changed your mind you know was there anything specific that you learned that showed you that it's worth trying yeah absolutely i think the very first thing was just reading the websites like the very first thing was getting more knowledge. So I, I remember spending a lot of my time on the Technician website, on the UK Global Talent Visa website, and just like soaking up all of the information, getting familiar with like the different kinds of visas, getting familiar with different kinds of applications as well. Like if you're a business applicant or a technical applicant, um, and it started to make a bit more sense as I spent more time reading. And I, um, and I started to think, you know, this might actually be possible, but I still wasn't convinced. I think the very first thing I did that convinced me was sort of just creating a document and looking through my experience and trying to scan for things that will match or be will work as evidences, essentially. So I think when I actually did that process of trying to look at my experience and seeing, okay, do I have any evidence that works for what technician is looking for? Um, and that was, it was at that point I started to actually be like, huh, this, this could be a real possibility. I could get this visa because when I looked through my experience, I saw that I had experience working with a product led or product first organization. I had, um, you know, lots of experience working in that, in roles that have been directly connected to the growth of the business outside of, you know, my day job. I've also made a lot of impact in the tech industry through mentorships, speaking at events, um, communities, that I'm part of and I've also, you know, been active in. So I realized that there were lots of things that I've done over the course of many years that actually work as evidences. So I think the first step was just scanning through my career history and comparing all of the different things I had done with what technician was asking for. And when I started to think about it that way, it really started to, you know, look possible to me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's very helpful, I think, that a lot of people do that. You need to map, you know, kind of write down everything that you can think of, that you're proud of. And this is just a document for you. Like, you don't have to show it to everybody. But I think it it helps you bring, build the confidence that you actually have some things to, you know, talk about. Because if you're just thinking about your experience um, kind of abstractly, then it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really help because it's easy to ignore it. But then once you write it down, 
you know, it changes completely how you view your history. It, it helped for me. I use the same approach, so it helped me as well. So did you prepare everything yourself, all the documents? And what was the process like? You know, how long it took? Uh, you know, how did you approach gathering all the documents? Um, yeah, just the mechanics of it, I think, would be helpful as well. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I did prepare all my documents myself. I think the very first thing I did was just create a document where I listed like all the different requirements. I listed all my, I guess, like all the things I had done and started to map out what I would use as my um, main um, application, like my mandatory documents and the things that I wanted to use as my optional documents as well. And then um, after identifying what I wanted to use, so for example, I worked for a product company before um, and my application was actually heavily based on the work that I did at that product company. So I decided that, okay, I'm going to do one evidence document kind of describing the process of working at that organization. What were the things that I achieved and the things that I achieved, how did they in turn you know, contribute to the company's growth. Um, and if there were any other, any evidences I could add to the document, so screenshots, anything basically. And it also helped that I had put together a portfolio in the past. So I was able to remove elements from my portfolio, feedback from my work, and really just use storytelling to help the technician, <laughs> I guess, organization understand what I did and what impact it made in the organization. So um, I did focus on things that were very qualitative, I'm sorry, quantitative. Um, I wanted to talk about like a lot of different metrics, a lot of numbers the, in ways that I helped to um, contribute to revenue. I wanted to spotlight things like that, different numbers that I was able to achieve as well with my work in terms of metrics. I wanted to bring that out. Um, something else that I also did that I think was also very helpful was um, adding supporting letters. So I know that technician obviously wants you to do three recommendation letters, but as part of my application, I also asked for supporting le letters from other members of an organization, of organizations where I'd worked and places where I'd mentored, you know, supporting letters from individuals who I thought, okay, I'm not going to ask these people to recommend me, but I think that technician needs to hear from these people in terms of, you know, how they think about my experience and what they um, what they have to say about my work, essentially. So I added supporting letters, and I think that that really helped with just giving overall context. Um, the entire process for me took around, it's, a, it's an interesting one because I applied at the end of January um, and then somewhere in the middle of February, so let's say three weeks, um, I heard back from technician and they actually rejected my application <laughs> the first time. Um, and it was really interesting because they sent, you know, a pro forma which, with like a decision letter, which basically told me the reasons why they thought that I wasn't qualified for the visa. And when I looked at the reasons, I realized that I didn't agree with a couple of them. And so I decided to appeal. And that's something that you can do when you're applying for the visa. You can appeal once. You can't add any um, evidence or any other documentation. You have to appeal based on things you already submitted before but you can appeal and share a different perspective if you think that, you know, if you want to argue. Um, and so I did that and it took another three weeks and then I eventually got my endorsement at the beginning of March in the first week of March. I actually got it on my birthday <laughs> on the 7th of March. I remember very clearly. So that's what it was like in terms of timelines. Amazing. I, I wasn't aware that you actually were refused the first time. Could you tell us a little bit more about high level? You know, a lot of people actually get refusals and sometimes i think that this is kind of the end of it so uh could you tell us a little bit more about how you approached actually appealing the decision and what are your tips around uh you know for somebody who got a rejection the first time around yeah absolutely um so i think the very first thing is recognizing that you can always appeal um because a lot of people like i also wasn't going to appeal to be honest before i thought very deeply about what the what they had said to me just the mere fact that you know it came back and it was a rejection and it was something i was unsure of in the first place i was just like yeah i don't think that this thing is going to work i was uh, going to give up on it but i slept on it for a few days um my friends also kept encouraging me to <laughs> appeal i think my friends honestly did play a really big role um but when i did decide to appeal I think the first thing I did was look at my entire application and then look at the reasons that they had um, chosen to deny the endorsement. And what I saw was that there were certain parts of my application that, you know, passed their requirements, like, for example, rem rem 
remuneration. This word always kicks me in the butt, but yeah. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to switch that to income. Seller it, basically, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know, yeah, I know. So I, have the, I have the same. I have the same issue with this word. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. I don't know why. But yeah, so um, I saw that, you know, in terms of my salary history, I already met the requirements. Like there was a consistent growth and you could see that I was getting paid higher than, you know, counterparts in the same field. And th that was just an established evidence that I had no arguing with. But I saw that they didn't, they didn't actually use that. They didn't reference it in the um, decision document at all. It was as though I never submitted that document from the feedback that they sent to me. So the very first thing I did was go back to them in my appeal whilst writing kind of like my appeal was essentially just answers to specific to the to the um to the decisions basically so they would say something like maybe for example oh we don't think you're qualified for this because we can't see xyz so then i would respond to that and say well i think i'm qualified because in addition to xyz i added xyz i know i'm saying a lot of xyz but um essentially to give you context i went back to look at my application and identify things that I knew that were things that I knew that worked, but they didn't reference. And I brought them back to light to be like, I also, you know, I submitted these documents. I submitted my salary history and this shows something, this goes to show something. And then finally addressing the things that they did, um, you know, talk about in the decision letter as well. So for example, one of my one of the reasons why they rejected the application the first time was saying something about not having sufficient evidence to on my impact in terms of events that i've spoken at for example um they said that they didn't think i had been a keynote speaker at a really big content marketing conference so they, for that reason they didn't think that i was qualified for the visa but i disagreed with them because i've been a speaker at on multiple panels with people with combined like over 50 years of experience and i have six years of experience so for me i felt like that goes to show something the fact that i was also invited to those panels and i got the opportunity to speak alongside experts that have been in the game for so long and i had something to contribute so you also have to be creative you have to stand up for yourself essentially and think about like you need to really believe what you're saying i think um because yeah, when I when I sent my appeal, I remember telling my friends like, I don't know what's going to happen because I feel like I was really like defensive, and I really stood up for myself in my appeal. I really showed them that you know this is how I think about myself, and this is how other people think about me based on the recommendation and supporting letters that I've I've submitted. So yeah, this is this is this is me, um, and they came back, I guess, yeah. <laughs> with the endorsement. Yeah. So I guess it worked. Yeah. Yeah, they they saw the light, you know, and then. But uh, interesting, it's a very interesting story. Uh, I like how you stood up for yourself and how you brought the evidences back to life. So sometimes it's all about explaining, you know, to the assessors that this is actually what I shown, and uh, appeals, you know, very often help because sometimes mistakes are made. You know, this is a person reviewing your documents; they can miss something, they can just forget a piece of evidence that you submitted and you just bring it back to their attention and also another person will actually review your documentation so you get another uh, assessor from you know from technician to review it and uh, the worst thing that can happen is that you get refused again but you will get a second piece of evidence a piece of feedback so that you can use in your second uh, application and the next time you can apply again there is no limit on how many times you can apply you just pay the fee and you apply with new documents because it doesn't really make sense to apply with the same ones uh, so in your case, was it that you didn't miss, like, uh, didn't meet all of the criteria or was it like you met two and one was rejected and you had to prove just one? Um, yeah, if you, if you remember, if you know, if not, not one worse. <laughs> I do, I do remember actually, they did say that I met one of the criteria and then I needed to prove for two, but it just didn't make sense to me because from the documents that I submitted, I knew that I met, I felt like I met all the criteria. Um, so that's what I told them in my appeal yeah. and they took it. So I feel like sometimes yeah, as nice well, just because I, I also have a lot of friends who have gone through this process. I feel like, and this is completely subjective. Um, I really feel like sometimes they just, they, I feel like they reject more than they accept. <laughs> and then they want like serious people to appeal. I, it is very subjective, but that's how it feels to me because I find that oftentimes, the, you know, people get rejections and then when they appeal, they get it, you know? So it, it almost feels like they just want that extra push 
from you. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe you need to yeah, interview also, someone from Technician <laughs> to tell us <laughs> tell us why. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I need to. You know, I need them to spill the beans on this. Uh, mm -hmm. But what what you see sometimes on the forums is that you would see people with very similar evidences. So people sometimes share the document that they submitted and then you will see somebody get a rejection and then somebody get an approval and from the looks of it it looks like the same uh, evidence pieces but here i think it's important to understand that you can present the same evidence in a completely different format so if you can hear if you hear that somebody got the visa for instance with some experience you should understand that if you have the same experience you will need still to kind of work hard and present it in a good way. And then if you hear that somebody got rejected who has similar experience as you, it also doesn't mean that you are intelligible. It's all about how you present it, how you structure your case, how you talk about yourself, what kind of letters you submit. So it is very, um, there are requirements and you need to meet them, but also a lot of it is very, it's kind of at the discretion of the assessor who is reviewing it. So yeah. uh, you need to understand that it's very, uh, you know, it's a process that has a human on the other side and we are all human. Mm -hmm. So it's important to think of just a person reviewing it, a uh, regular person and your task to is to make their job as easy as possible with your documents. Uh, but yeah, thank you for sharing this experience of getting the rejection. I'm sure that it must have been uh, stressful uh, at the time, but you didn't give up. So <laughs> I know we we're talking about this. So that's, that's an inspiration. Uh, so go, moving, moving back to going back to the details of the documents, could you please share a little bit more examples maybe of document that you submitted um, as a content marketing professional? I think that this will be helpful to people who work in the same field and aren't sure which kind of documents they can use. Yeah, absolutely. So for my mandatory criteria, I essentially submitted um three different documents so one was an evidence of just my work at a product company so i essentially described kind of my experience joining the organization the work that i did there the impact i was able to make so i was able to um connect the metrics from just my content marketing efforts to things like revenue for the organization. And it's all storytelling at the end of the day. Through the work that I was able to do, the brand got, of course, increased brand awareness, got more opportunities to connect with customers that obviously increases revenue. So it's all about finding that connection um, between what you do on a day to day and helping the person on the other side, the person reading the, the documents through your storytelling, helping them understand how the work that you did was really essential to getting the company to where they are or where they got to, you know? So essentially that, that document was really just talking about that experience there. I also put some examples of my work. At that company, I did a lot of newsletter writing. Um, I did a lot of content creation, honestly. So I think um, I just put some links to things like that. I put some images just to give them some context into, you know, when I talk about my work, this is what I'm talking about. Of course, you have to be careful to keep it at three pages max. So whilst you're doing storytelling and you're adding all this information and context, you need to make sure that it is still concise and still, you know, has the most important point as, as quantitative as possible, has lots of metrics and is succinct, really. Um, I also added another document on kind of like just speaking events, so evidence of just like speaking. Um, and in that document, I just described, I chose, I actually had to choose, I remember, I chose some key events that met the criteria, because if you read the technician websites, you see that there's also criteria for you know the kind of events that they think work so um i chose those events and i talked about those events and talked about what my contribution to the events were if i was a speaker if i was a moderator added some images as well really storytelling um i think the third one was also another evidence document from my work at a different product company um and pretty much followed the same format as the first one um and then for optional documents i did some evidence of impact at a product company as well. Um, oh no, sorry, I made a mistake actually. For my mandate, my for my mandatory documents, yeah. Um, one of the documents was actually the one about my salary growth, not the product company, right? So it was about my salary growth at a specific company, um, and then the events and my work at a different product company. And then for the optional one, I talked about my impact at the product company. Um, and then I talked about also mentoring as well. Um, 
and impact at the other company I was working at. I really just described my entire career experience, honestly, and broke it down into which ones I wanted to be in, optional, which ones I wanted to be mandatory based on advice from technician websites. And also, of course, based on things that I felt more strongly about as well in terms of my experience so far. Um, and of course, I added my resume, I added a personal statement. Advice for your personal statement, I would say like just a tip, use that place. I think a personal statement is really an opportunity to show the person who's reading in who you are, um, help them understand what you're passionate about, help them understand what, what it is that you want from your career for the future and why the UK is the place that you have to be to achieve those things. So that's really what I did with my personal letter. Of course, I added my three letters of recommendation. Um, one of them was from a senior leader at a team at an organization, someone who had worked with me directly. Um, another one was from someone who is in the industry and knows my work was spoken together at a new series of events. Another one was from someone else that I'd worked with closely as well, another senior leader at an organization. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, I had some supporting letters from, um, one of them was from a community I had mentored with in the past. And then the other was from another senior leader at an organization I worked with before. So that's kind of like a summary of all the documents I had. Um, I hope that yeah, helps. amazing. <laughs> so yeah, of course, I, uh, I'm seeing that you chose the significant contribution and the uh, the outside uh, recognition criteria, uh, which is great. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing, I'm, I've, I've been asked a lot of questions about the outside contribution, about the mentoring side of things and kind of giving back to the community. Maybe you could share a little bit more about your experience mentoring, like what kind of organizations were this, like what is, was the format, how long you did that? Because people always ask questions like, how long do I need to do this? Or like how many mentees should I have? You know, things like that. I think right. this will also help people give an, give an understanding of the requirements. Yeah. Um, so for my application, I did have three specific things. So. Um, in my career, I've also started a community um, called Smarketers Hub. So I kind of just explained my work at Smarketers Hub, which is really a community for smart marketers, as the name implies, to grow their careers together, to get access to opportunities. So I talked about what I was doing with Smarketers Hub. I also talked about like mentoring for another community. So there's a community called Tech Marketers Hub, which I've also mentored for. Um, in that one actually was just one mentee. It was a very integrated like mentoring session where a mentoring, um, oh, I'll call it a session, but it was a program really, where it was really integrated. I worked very closely with that mentee to kind of like just design what their career was going to look like, following up very closely. I'm just working together with them more like a coach. So that was that was also really helpful. Um, and then in the past as well, I've also had the opportunity to mentor startups um, through a different platform as well. So I just I wrote about those three um, those three opportunities. But at the same time, I am a mentor with ADP List, which is a mentoring platform as well. And that it's honestly so fantastic. It helps with structuring and helps to you know just create a system around getting access to mentees um, and mentees also of course getting access to you whilst you know working with your time and um, just putting lots of structure. Um, I actually joined ADP list around after I had already applied just because it was something I found but I knew that you know if I was doing it before it's something I would have definitely in included in my application and I know a lot of people that have also you know mentored on ADP list and I've included that in their application as well so I would say figure out what works for you but um yeah that i had a mix of different things yeah amazing actually we i interviewed somebody who was a mentor at adp list on my channel and got the visa as well uh so there are a variety of platforms that you can join usually technician recommends that this is uh within a structured mentorship program uh yeah. and i'm just seeing i'm seeing like rejections on forums for people saying that it's it wasn't clear that this is a structured program of mentorship and also it wasn't if it's not clear what kind of impact you had within this so if you are using examples of mentorship or teaching a volunteer in our community, make sure that you are include, you know, details about what you are doing specifically, what kind yeah. of impact you had, and also, you know, how much time did you actually spend on this, you know, so that they show, mm -hmm. it shows that you are actually seriously involved into this. Uh, but yeah. it's, it's actually, I think, uh, a great thing to, you know, give back to the community at the same time, you're building up your own uh, personal brand, uh, you're 
giving back, you're teaching others, and also you're getting uh, like a cherry on the top is that you're getting a very strong st document for the uh, outside contributions uh, for the visa as well. Uh, so I think that this this can be seen as a nice push to people who have always wanted to volunteer but never had this, uh, you know, encouragement. And this is the encouragement. Uh, so we mentioned, okay, we talked about the criteria. We talked about the supporting evidences. The letters you mentioned who signed them. Um, was it difficult for you to get them signed? What was the process like? Did it take you a long time to get what? I mean, what was the process of getting them signed? Because this is, again, people who are unsure have never dealt with this. It can be a little bit scary to ask somebody who is high up in the chain of command in your company to ask for a letter. Like, how do you do this? How do you approach this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, honestly, so for me, the very first step was picking those people, actually figuring out who would be the best people to speak on my experience and what kind of things would they say if they wanted to talk. Um, and another thing is just making it as easy as possible. I've, you know, I've seen people who have written the letters um that's what i did <laughs> written the letters and sent it to the people to make sure that they can endorse it and of course they may have changes or um edits but you've you've put together that framework so they don't have to spend too much time thinking about actually writing the letter from scratch i've seen other people who have gotten on calls and transcribed the calls you know just thinking about the best way to get what you want your goal should always be what do you want to get? You want to get a letter? How? What's the best way to collaborate with this person to get a letter out of them? So, um, yeah, I, I think first step, choosing the people. Second step, figuring out the best and the quickest way to get the letter sorted. Um, for me, I just wrote, I wrote them. And some more advice on the letters, actually. I think something that really helped was also just making sure to reinforce a lot of the metrics that I had mentioned across my documents in the letters as well. So getting that extra reinforcement coming from the senior ex experts as well, saying things like, for example, at the product company, I said something about how my work directly contributed to X million dollars in revenue. And that's something that can be reinforced in the letter coming from the senior leader that that is honestly just is great it's fantastic so if you have the opportunity to reinforce your metrics you know using these letters it, i think it's a great thing to do as well to just help your application yeah excellent approach i think that this is also some, something that people struggle with how to approve the metrics uh if there are no publications about this and it's not an external information you can just put those things kind of in the mouth of the people who are writing your letters. And then it's coming from an expert in the field and it already has authority behind it. So this is something that you can definitely consider. Uh, my framework when I advise people on the letters is that your letter of recommendation ideally should fulfill the criteria that you have chosen on its own, you know? So it's kind of like a little snippet of your application so that mm -hmm. if you've chosen the same criteria that for instance you have chosen, the letter would be talking about the uh, your leadership uh, recognition, how you're recognized as a leader, and then it would be talking about your significant commercial contributions to the company or your technical contributions. Although even for technical candidates, honestly, it kind of ki comes down to money. Uh, in a lot of the cases that I'm seeing is that how did your technical achievement, how did the feature that you built, how did it make money for the business and how much money did it make for them? Ultimately, this is mm -hmm. kind of the point of the com commercial impact that they see. And then it's nice if the, if the, less, the letter also mentions that you work for the community and how the person writing this letter is really admiring your contribution. So this is just something that might help you uh, create those letters if you're blocked. So just think of this, you know, highlights of everything that you want to, to mention in your application and just talk through the story. Um, yeah, and I agree. Like I've not heard anybody yet who would ask the person, the referee to write the letter themselves. Like it's just not feasible for a leader in a position of power. They don't have the time. They, they're just too busy. You know, you need to help them help you. Uh, so yeah. this is, um, uh, this is great. Um, okay. Letters are covered. I think you mentioned personal statement that this is, you know, an opportunity for somebody to tell a story. It's important yeah. that, you know, you say something that is specifically to you, you know, something personal. Um, yep. 
Was there, was there anything else about, around the process of preparing documents that you think uh, would be helpful uh, for others? And before you answer, I just wanted to tell our audience that we'll be answering the questions soon. So if you have them, if you waited until now to ask them, make sure to ask them now. This is like a unique opportunity to ask, ask an expert live. So drop them into the comments and we'll get to them. We have quite a lot of uh, questions. Actually, it's, I think, probably one of the most, one of the busiest live streams that I've had. So that's very good. Yeah. So, if do you have any other like you know advice, <laughs> thoughts on the process of preparing documents? Something that you want to share with viewers? Uh, I think just some more general tips. Um, you have to pay attention to detail. I honestly think that attention to detail, you know, because for me, I I didn't really have any experience with this before. I spoke to my friend who was obviously a very big help because she had gone through the process before, but at the same time, um, I had to really think about like unique ways or creative ways to make sure that the information that I'm sharing, I've paid a lot of attention to detail, make sure that everything is right, everything looks good. I've covered all my bases and you know, there are no silly mistakes that could cost me the visa really. So I would say attention to detail and patience is really, really important. Just take your time take time to actually get as familiar with the process as possible. Read the website, like that's the very first first thing. Actually read the website. I've had so many people reach out to me like, oh, how can I do this? How can I do that? And once I start talking, I immediately know the people who haven't like read the website. And I'm just like, go and read the website. So I would say read the website. <laughs> There's a lot of helpful information on the website. Um, and then, you know, take your time, identify the things that you have, the, um, identify the things that match like different criteria for the application from your experience and then start putting your documents together um, and apply when you feel ready. Yeah, amazing, thank you for that. I shared a link to the technician visa guide in the description. Uh, this is the single source of truth for all things uh, global talent visa. Yeah. Anything that anybody tells you, you know, what you see on this channel, uh, always double check that it still matches the guide. Uh, it changes. It just changed very recently, which was uh, kind of a shock to a lot of people. So the recent, the most recent change is that now if you are getting a letter of reference from an expert, it's it's required that they are actually, uh, they have detailed awareness of your work for at least 12 months. So this is what changed because before that, there, it wasn't really a requirement and mm -hmm. it makes things tougher for people who are newer to the field, who don't mm -hmm. have such a big network. So make sure that you are aware of it and you try to reach out to people who know you for at least a year uh, and mm -hmm. just follow the guide. Uh, it changes. They have a change log uh, and keep, you know, keep up to date with the changes uh, as well. Uh, you can follow me on this channel. I also provide updates on things that change in the community uh, tab I had a post there recently. So that can be helpful too. Uh, thank you for the, all the advice. I think we should start get started on the questions because we've got so many of them, which is amazing. Okay, so, um, okay, let's see. Okay, we got this question. Uh, were you endorsed for promise or talent? And maybe you could share a little bit about what the difference is, how do people understand it? Right, I was endorsed for Promise. Um, in terms of the actual visa that you get, so Promise, you get a visa for five years um, before you are able to apply for an ILR, which is your leave to remain. Um, and then for talent, I think you get the visa for three years. Um, in terms of the application and what that means, Promise is essentially being getting endorsed as someone who's promising in your field um, and ex someone who's exceptionally promising, um, which means that you have lots of potential for the future um, based on your work and track record. Whereas talent is more for people who you know, have already demonstrated a, a consistent track record over a period of time of impact. Um, you know, I've seen lots of like startup founders who have been endorsed as talents, people who have been in industry for many, many years, you know, so people who have an evidence track record, who have lots of, you know, just evidence about their work and they've made lots of like quantifiable impact. Those are the people that often get talent that I've seen. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the difference, but I'm on the premise. 
Yeah, yeah. So here, I think what is helpful is that it is very much connected to how much time you've been in the industry. Technician mentions five years, so if it's fewer than five years, then uh, the traditional way is to go for promise, or if it's more than for talent. But it is not as strict, so it means that if you already have a lot of achievements, if you have, as they say, a track record, for instance, of innovation, then you can try to apply for talent. Uh, if it's just one example of innovation, then it sounds more like promise, but this is very, very dependent on the case, I would say. So, but it helps to think about it um, in this sort of way. But then otherwise the visas are the same in terms of the rights that they give you. It's just that you are you need to spend a little bit more time in the UK to get the permanent residency. Um, and then, you know, you can get the citizenship, uh, kind of the same, the same rules apply. So, uh, Read the guide and think of whether what works for you better. Um, I would say that if you've spent years and years in the industry, like 10 or 15 years, then you wouldn't really be able to qualify for promise because it is a little bit, uh, you've spent so much time in the industry that you should already have like a track record of success. If you don't have it now, then you should work on imp improving your application and maybe applying a little bit later. Uh, but if you're just entering the field, I think that promise can be a great way to try getting this visa and not wait, you know, for years until you have the all the other, you know, success. By this time, you can be already like a permanent residence here and just enjoying your new life in the UK. Um, okay, we've got another question, but I think that you pretty much covered it about mentorship. You mentioned ADPD list. Anything else? Any other? Uh, maybe you can mention the other platforms if you wish, or yeah. Yeah, so Smarketers Hub, which is my community, um, I have organized mentorship um, opportunities through that. And then also Tech Marketers Hub, which is another community that I got, that I got mentored with. Um, and then the third one was a more one-off type of business mentorship that was still organized, um, but that one isn't active anymore. So it's probably not helpful to mention that one. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, are, those are some of the platforms. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, another one was about evidences. What type of evidences did you submit from work? Did it have to directly impact revenue? Um, so I did connect my work to revenue. And I think that's something that helps generally is, you know, it's always helpful to understand how the work that you're doing connects to revenue at an organization. You know, we work, on, we work as part of a marketing team. Your work is very much connected to the revenue. Um, so I think just having that mindset of the fact that, you know, the content marketing that I'm doing as part of a marketing team is what is helping us get achieve our goals in terms of like, you know, what what we want and what whatever those goals look like. It could be sales, it could be fundraising, whatever it is really that the organization that you're working for is prioritizing at that time. You need to ha have that knowledge of how it connects. And that's knowledge that you should have just by virtue of having the job. And then what I did was really just tell a story about that knowledge. like. So I know that my work is connected to revenue because I did X, Y, and Z. The company was able to, um, you know, get increased brand awareness. We're able to connect to their customers better and it impacted our revenue and we grew from X to Y really. So telling a story is the same thing that you, you talk about in your work every day. I would presume that you would um, really just be telling a story of. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Also, it helps that if you work at a company that has uh, performance review procedures, then you will usually be required to create this performance review doc where you talk about all the things that you have done and their impact. And this is something that uh, I think pretty much everybody at the company that has this process does, like both technical candidates, non-technical, everybody has to uh, make a case for you to get promoted. I think that this doc can really help you if you struggle understanding how your work impacts uh, any metrics at the company. So we had another one. How did you prove uh, those numbers and metrics? Here you mentioned that they were mentioned in your support and evidences in your letters of recommendation. Yeah. Was there any other documents that you could use uh, in that case? Um, for me, I did not actually have any other documents. I just had them reinforced mm -hmm. in the letters because the letters were also coming from senior members of the same organization. Um, that, that was what I did really. But in terms of metrics, for my work i did have like screenshots from like reports showing metrics from things like you know um maybe newsletter engagement um there was a community that i managed as part of a product company that i worked at that had like over twenty five thousand members and it grew from eight thousand members to twenty five thousand members in just a number of months so that was also something that i added um so i did have some evidences of metrics in terms of like screenshots for my actual work but in terms of metrics from 
a revenue perspective for the organization, I wasn't going to bring our, I don't know, account balance or balance sheet into my application. So I just had that reinforced in my letters. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's. I think that's what, what people usually do. If there is something that is public, maybe like you helped raise some money for the company. Then, if this is public, you can attach a screenshot and the link to mm -hmm. the publication yeah. or press release or something like that. But very often, you can't really show this like any other proof because it's internal information. But letters work. Uh, it's usually better to have some other evidences in general in your application so that your application mm -hmm. is not just letters, something else. Yeah. Uh, as yeah. you mentioned, sc screenshots, dashboards, all works, works for business candidates and for developers. It's like, you know, on GitHub, you can get the stars, the forks. And then if you have a blog, you can get the stats of how many people view it, subscribers, growth, all of this stuff really works. Um, if you mm -hmm. can get anything like that, statistics, they, it all shows your impact uh, and your, you know, contributions, basically. Okay, we have yeah. another one, which is very interesting. Uh, how did you connect the impact of your work uh, as a content manager to the revenue stream of your product-led company? What metrics did you measure to achieve this? Right, perfect. Um, so for me, in my role, I did a lot of things. I joined the company at you know, eight days to a huge rebrand, and I worked there for close to two years. So there, were, there was a lot of different things that I did that I just knew that if I didn't do, we literally wouldn't have gotten to where we got to. So it was honestly not too difficult. I, you know, I know that, like, um, in fact, let me, let me read a line. <laughs> Because for me, what I said was essentially like, additionally, I managed the copy development and design product process for product marketing on multiple channels, including performance marketing, print advertising, and billboard ads leading to XYZ in revenue in 2019 compared to XYZ in revenue in 2018. So essentially, like, it was really storytelling. Like, I was just telling them that because I did all the work I did with advertising, with marketing, with community management, with newsletters, with branding, all of these things helped us grow our revenue from X to Y. And I feel like this is something that anybody at any in any role in the organization will be able to say. Customer success, for example, and, and I know that this may not be necessarily relevant to the Global Talent Visa, but I'm just saying that if someone in customer success wanted to connect their, their work to revenue, they can say something about like improving the overall cu customer experience, helping to contribute to increased revenues, you know? So at the end of the day, it still, it leads back to what I said before. I think for me, it was really connecting the impact of my work to the revenue stream is not something I had to do for the global talent visa. It's something that I already know based on just like my work at the organization. It's something that I, I even think that everyone should be aware of. You should always know kind of, how the day-to-day -day work that you're doing is impacting the overall growth of the organization. Else, you know, you kind of have to now wonder, like, why am I doing these things? If, you know, you have to know what the impact of your work is. So um, I think I just put it out there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, agree, agree. It's very, it's important for everybody, no matter what your role is, to understand yeah. this stuff. There was another uh, interesting question. How did you position yourself to get invited to speakers, uh, to events as a speaker? Right. Um, I think I actually did a lot of reaching out as well. So in terms of positioning myself, um, I talked a lot about my work. I wanted to be as visible as possible with my community as well. I shared about my work on like social media. But outside of all of that, honestly, I think I did a lot of reaching out. So if, if I saw that, you know, an interesting event was coming up, I would actually reach out to who's organizing, apply to be a speaker. Um, and yeah, I got a lot of opportunities by putting myself out there. So that's, I did a more forward first approach than, I think now I'm at the place where I do get, you know, lots of invites. Um, but earlier in my career, I did a lot of like putting myself out there and asking for things to actually get them. Yeah, I agree. I did the same. So for me, uh, I was asked once, why, how did you get like so many people to interview you or have you as a guest on your podcast? But, you know, if you're not famous, if you don't have a following, uh, and like right now it changed for me because I have a bigger following, but 
in the past, I needed to reach out to bloggers, to YouTubers, to people who have, you know, whatever following on Twitter or somewhere and kind of doing some sort of cooperation with them. Maybe they would interview me, maybe they would write about me or something like that. This would help me raise awareness about my work. So for instance, when I was promoting my book, this is kind of what I did. I just pitched myself as a person that might be a good guest. And honestly, people are usually very excited, especially if they are not, if they don't have a huge channel yet or like a huge audience, then it's easy to get connected with them. And they usually, they sometimes struggle with having enough guests, you know, as it is. So if you're coming to them, you're actually helping them. So it's not like you are asking to just for yourself. You're helping them as well if you're providing valuable information and good content. So it's content for them. Like without them, there is no channel. So like without my guests, like there is this, you know, uh, live streams aren't possible. So I really appreciate people coming in <laughs> and telling their story. So it is a valuable exchange for everybody. So I would encourage you to be active, reach out to people and suggest that you yeah. talk to them about your product, your whatever you're doing. Uh, because Tech Nation, they, what I've heard is that assessors there, and this is not verified, but just rumors that they Google your name and they would see, you know, where you come up in the search. So it's good if you are recognizable online. So uh, this is something that you can do for yourself. Just Google your name in English and in the language, you know, the country where you're coming from to see, you know, what people, you know, where you appeared. You might discover actually that you were mentioned somewhere, which is, you know, helpful. Okay, so yeah. there was another one about optional criteria. We did cover it. So if you join later, then you can scroll back, but it was the outside contribution. So basically community mentoring uh, and all that, and then significant commercial contributions. Um, so yeah, um, what was the next one? Which two criteria did you not meet when you were first rejected? <laughs> if you remember, if not, no worries. <laughs> I actually don't know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I think yeah, no, it's not. It might have been the mandatory and optional ones, which is weird because it's like those are the two one. Those are the two criteria. But I think I might have to go and look for the performer for that one. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, no, it's yeah. Uh, okay, so okay, another one. How many years of work must I use in the product like organization before I can be eligible? Here, I would say that, mm. uh, so with the recent changes, it kind of becomes a little bit more challenging because if you are using an example, a letter about your work at a certain company, then the person who's writing it, they have to talk about how they know your work for at least a year. So if you only worked for three months, then it might be challenging. Like, how do you present this? Maybe you knew them before you started working on them, then maybe. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that there is like any specific requirement, like how many years you know you need to have. Uh, so you, there is no strict rule there, but I would say that, um, yeah, I don't think that there is a rule. It's just, that it's more about like what impact you've, you have had at the company. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, would you I agree? agree with you. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do agree. <laughs> um, I, in fact, <laughs> drawing from my experience as well, like when I think about it, the cognitive amount of time for my product led experience. It's just about two years. Well, it's more now, but at the time I applied, it was about like two years in, in total. And I was applying with a career history of six years. So yeah, I think yeah. it does vary for everyone. Yeah, I think that the sometimes people apply for, you know, a year, like year and a half, two. I think this is like the minimum that I've heard. But this is not to say that if you, sometimes also people use the academic contributions requirement. And in this case, you can use your academic achievements as one of the optional criteria. So uh, it means that if you recently graduated, for instance, from a PhD program or something like that, then you might not have that much professional experience, but you have the academic background. So it really depends on your case um, and which criteria you, you choose. So in terms of uh, timing, uh, I think, uh, could you remind us again, how long did it take you to prepare all of it? Um... It took me around three weeks to prepare everything. I applied, it took them three weeks to get back to me and reject me. And then I appealed and it took another three weeks. So a total of, I think, nine weeks. Yeah. Between, so it's yeah. not that long, I would say. Uh, no. Compared to some, exactly other, some other visas. Yeah. Okay, another one. Uh, do you think a social media dashboard showing growth in following or reach could be considered as impact? 
Um, I definitely think yes, but you need to connect how this following or rich is helping the organization. Like, what does this what does this following or rich that is increasing? What does it mean for the business that you are working for? So that's always the the, the key point to make sure that you're connecting it back to if you know if they're increasing in following and reach does this mean that they're increasing in like brand awareness does this ultimately connect to like their revenue numbers do you have that information so yeah it does work but you need to make sure that you're always closing that loop of connecting it back to the organization's larger goals yeah excellent thank you uh, did you have to differentiate when stating the evidence in the title pieces, for example, mandatory evidence of black, black, blah, <laughs> and optional uh, evidence of something else? How did you, um, uh, I guess <laughs> this is about the, to try, the, the names of the documents. Yeah, I did name my documents, but I think when you're actually applying, you can't make a mistake because you need to upload like each document. And you, when you're applying, you will see, <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> but yes, you can name your documents um, yeah, and say yeah. like, which it's ones a, are mandatory and optional. Yeah, it, it, there on the dashboard right now, what they ask you is you have to choose the criteria and then they ask you to write, the, you kind of need to write the names of the documents and the criteria, yeah. to which criteria they, they map. So it's easier if your document is called something sensible, not like one, two, three. Mm -hmm. So that it's, it's called, yeah. for instance, public speaking, you know, something or like mm -hmm. letter of support reference from company X. So this yeah. will help you to make this easier. But also I've heard this advice that you shouldn't call the documents with the concrete um, names of the criteria. Uh, but I don't think that there are any specific requirements around that. Technician doesn't specify it. So it's kind of all about making it as easy for them to review them as possible. So it's not, there are no requirements right now. Maybe this will change and they will ask you to call them a separate way. Then, you know, you need to do that. But for now, we just know that these are 10 evidence pieces and they can be in a variety of formats. Most people do PDFs, I think, at this point. Um, and what else do we know? You know, for the three pages, no requirements on fonts. Although people yeah. sometimes go crazy and use like tiny fonts to squeeze oh, as no. much as possible. <laughs> But please yeah, make your documents legible. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, right. yeah, but sometimes you have so you have so much stuff you want to you know put everything in. But yeah, just uh, choose the most important things that fit in three pages. That's that's I think the, the best one. Um, okay, uh, another one for talent visa. What if all your evidences are innovation startups? Would that be a problem? What do you think? I'm not quite sure how to answer this one. Um, I know that for just to get the technician visa, you need to have a diverse like set of evidences. It can't be all like one kind of evidence, at least from what I know. But Nadia, we are perhaps more equipped to take yeah, this one. <laughs> yeah. So, so for for innovation, I would say that innovation is basically one of the optional criteria. So. Uh, you can choose it if you can prove that your work is innovative. So, for instance, people with startups, they often choose this criteria because they can show that their startup was innovative. Uh, so you can submit this uh, documents about startups towards this criteria. Uh, but then um, you would have to choose another optional criteria, which might be either, you know, your community work and kind of outside work, or it can be significant contribution within your places of work. Uh, but here you would need to choose something, um, structure the evidence differently and show how your work was making a significant contribution to the, uh, to the company. So, uh, it, these are different criteria and, uh, you can't basically like use the same words to fulfill two different criteria. You need to understand, okay, with this piece of work, was it innovative? Uh, and like this piece of work was for instance, um, you know, significant contribution, um, and yeah, I think a technician guide that I mentioned before, that I linked to before, they mentioned examples of how you can prove that something is innovative. It is typically a complex criteria to prove for people, but I think that it's still possible. Uh, you can use things like um, basically publications that mention how your product is innovative. Then you can use uh, letters of support that talk about your, your products being innovative. Uh, then there are patents, but like, 
who has patents, but you know, you have a patent and congrats, you can use it um, and various things like that. So uh, I think this helps. And also it doesn't have to be like technical innovation. It can be innovation around process or the way of doing things. So if you mm -hmm. came up with another, like a strategy, so for instance, like a go-to-market strategy that was completely innovative, that just changed the industry or changed like the direction of your company and brought, you know, in so much like money and like new clients or something, then this can also be innovative. So think creatively about innovation. I think that innovation criteria is under <laughs> underappreciated. I think that there is a lot of uh, potential there as well. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so, uh, okay, somebody is the first time on my channel, welcome. And yeah, I hope you subscribe and follow uh, for more streams like this. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, kind of a little bit about my experience. So yeah, for my experience, I'm um, a career changer. I used to be a journalist uh, and I taught myself to code a few years back um, and kind of started sharing about my experience online publicly. Wrote a book about it, um, then was active in various communities here uh, in London. So I was volunteering in organizations like uh, Women Who Code and others. Um, so doing a lot of community work similar uh, to what Aisha said right now. Um, and uh, yeah, worked with a couple of companies. So for me, I was, I was also granted the promise route. I think that specifically because I am relatively new to the industry. Um, and um, yeah, took me three weeks, four weeks to get endorsed. Uh, for me, I did the application process on my own. Um, I actually found it pretty challenging. I think right in my head around all the requirements. Uh, but uh, once I think I understood it, it became a little bit easier, but still, um, I would say for me, like lack of confidence was also an issue as for many people. Like I didn't think that I was eligible because uh, as a career changer, as somebody who isn't really from the tech world initially, I think it's very hard to convince yourself that you can actually apply for the same route as people from Facebook who have studied computer science and who've done all this stuff. And you're just like self-taught, uh, kind of trying to survive in this industry. But it really helped me. I think that my experience volunteering and mentoring people and kind of being a career coach. Um, and I think the book also helped. Uh, so all of, the, all of those things combined. So I think that um, I want to encourage people who might be career changers because this is like, I'm not the only person that I know who changed careers and like a lot of people do this. So if you are, you weren't on technical, you entered the technical field, uh, you can still build a case if you show contribution and if you show um, achievements there. Uh, it just might be that since you're new to the field, they might give you a promise. They might also give you talent if you show, you know, a more like a more big like a bigger track record of like technical achievements technical success uh but yeah that's kind of my intro uh you can check out my channel i have a couple of videos there about myself so i have a video about like how i learned to code and how i came to this life of living in tech uh and yeah a lot of other stuff um yeah we don't have any more questions i think so uh we can wrap it up or would you like to share like some parting thoughts if not totally no pressure we can wrap up um, I think just one final thing for me, um, definitely, I've said it before, but pay attention to detail, make sure that your metrics are quant quantitative. I don't know why I keep trying to say qualitative, <laughs> quantitative, um, and, you know, take the time to actually look through your experience. There's lots of things, you know, that you can leverage in your application there's lots of little context that you can add lots of personalization that you can do lots of storytelling as well that can really help you stand out and really help you make your case um i honestly think that storytelling was a really big part of my application so yeah tell your stories help the person on the other side you know learn a bit more about you and why they need to give you the global talent visa <laughs> Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for all the encouragement. Um, I do appreciate you spending the time and talking about this. There is close to zero information about getting this for content marketing managers and general people who work with content or work with marketing. So if you work in fields that are related somehow, 
you don't dismiss this video just because like your title is a little bit different. If you do something slightly different, you can still get inspired by this. So I do hope that this helps. Uh, if you need like further support, you can go to my website and see like the ways that I help people increase our chances for getting endorsed. Follow this channel. I have a couple of interesting um, live streams planned already. So I will be interviewing um, actually, I think almost yeah, I will be interviewing both technical candidates and business ones. So I have an interview coming up with a developer advocate, which is very exciting since I just recently moved into this new role, new profession. So I will also a uh, com uh, communications professional and a product manager. So if you are working in those fields, this might also be helpful. If you know people who work in those fields and who are interested in relocating, but think that they aren't eligible, Make sure to point them to my channel as well. Um, yeah, with that out of the way, I think we can wrap up. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. This has been such an active community today. So many, uh, so many questions, so many comments. So we've got this, love this chat. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sure for your time with us. Your story is amazing. I love your ambition. You rock. <laughs> I agree. Uh, <laughs> thank you everybody thank you. for here. Yeah. Uh, if thank you have further you. questions or yeah, if you're watching this in recording, uh, make sure to ask them in the comments. We'll be happy to answer them later. Thank you so much and have a nice rest of the day. Bye.